Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. This is incredibly humbling. I just had a flash. This felt like the end of Star Wars. Where they get to... <laughs> um, this is uh, what an honor to receive this. Um, and uh, it's incredibly humbling. And, and we're acutely aware of the, uh, the really prestigious group that's gone before us. Everyone from Nelson Mandela and Jimmy Carter to Václav Havel to Corey Aquino. It just goes on and on. And, and, uh, and those people were really... Um, continue to inspire us. Um, I think, you know, for us, we, we, our, our great hope is that this, this is such a wonderful and prestigious thing, and hopefully it can operate as a signal effect to donors, large and small, that we're actually a good place to either donate or invest, which you'll hear more about. Uh, we didn't want to do a long speech. We're going to do a discussion instead, because it's a little, a little easier for everybody. And, um, uh, and uh, so, hope, so you'll hear from us about, about all that in a little bit, but this is just incredibly humbling, uh, and we're, we're very grateful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it, is, it is humbling. Uh, I think, you know, Lynn and John and Robert, I mean, I... I <laughs> yeah, and Thales, yeah, 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 standing in. Uh, just the way you spoke about water and what we're doing, it, it's just, it's so humbling to have such, uh, you know, articulate, passionate people talking about what we do, and it is very humbling. It's, uh, it, this, this award for human understanding, uh, I think that th there's nothing that I've seen that's more core that crosses understanding across all cultures and all people uh, is water. Uh, you know, we live in different places, we practice different religions, we eat different foods, we speak different languages. But today, everybody did one thing together as a planet, they took a drink of water. And to have that bind us together as humanity and that understanding that can cross, uh, hopefully, you know, we're a small part of that. And this is a great step for us in continuing the journey that Lynn uh, has definitely appointed us to carry on. <laughs> and we're, we're grateful for that. And I, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the, the, the donors and investors that we have here, uh, the Bezos Earth Fund, uh, Amazon, Xylem, uh, the Development Finance Corporation, who have believed in this work and supported it, and the water.org and water equity teams that are here, and past and present board members, uh, Jill Nash, Andy Sarian, uh, Paul O'Connell, and Lynn Taliento, who did relent and join the board. <laughs> so again, thank you, and we look forward to the, to the dialogue we're gonna have with Melissa Block now, if we can find Melissa. All right. Joining um, Gary and Matt on stage for the conversation is Melissa Block, NPR journalist, Fulbrighter to Switzerland, and recipient of the Fulbright Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. Please welcome Melissa Block. Hi. Thanks for looking. Are you, are you here? I'm here. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. And I'm so excited to get to talk to these two gentlemen about their work. Um, and congratulations on this incredible honor. Um, I was thinking this morning when I turned on the tap and drew a glass of water, it's something that many of us just take for granted until there's a drought or a crisis like Flint, Michigan or Jackson, Mississippi. But it's obviously nothing that you two take for granted. So why don't you talk just a little bit, Gary, why don't you start about how water became the driving passion of your life? <laughs> Well, for me, I, I was drawn to engineering, as it's been mentioned, and uh, felt, you know, kind of like a techie and, and wanted to move in that direction. But I also had uh, people in my life instill this sense of, you know, social justice, and uh, my parents, uh, teachers. And so when I was studying engineering and looking at, you know, what, what might be the intersection between engineering in social justice. I was studying aerospace engineering at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I switched my degree to, to civil engineering because I felt like that was, you know, learning about this problem, billions of people without access to water and sanitation. Uh, and that's what drew me to it. And it was a, you know, fairly simplistic decision then as the story unfolds, you'll recognize this is much less about uh, physical 
engineering in pipes, uh, although that's part of it. It's really about financial engineering. And so I had to kind of get reschooled in financial engineering as this has uh, unfolded. And that possibility of you know, bringing my life and intersecting with this crisis is all I've ever done uh, since and uh, been very fortunate. Yeah, and teaming up with Matt, Matt, same question about when water became such a focus of interest for you. Uh, well, I was, I was looking at all these issues of extreme poverty and I was just shocked by how <clears throat> water really undergirded everything. And, and growing up in the West, I just didn't really know about it. And, um, and I think that's the, actually the first kind of hurdle that we have to clear when we talk about this with people, because it's so hard to relate to if you're from, if you're from say, America or you know, somewhere here in the West. Um, we've never really been thirsty. We're never really too far from a, a clean drink of water. It's in such abundance around us yeah. um, that you know, when, when, when you see people raising money for different things, if they're, you know, if it's, you know, AIDS or cancer, they're, they're, that's much more relatable. One of us would have a family member, you know, who's affected by that or a friend who's affected by those things. W water, it's very hard unless you, unless you travel a lot or you're in the third world a lot to really understand what it's like to be affected yeah. by it. So, so that's the very first thing. And that was the kind of an epiphany for me, it was going on a water collection with a young, a young girl in Zambia and, um, and really connecting with her and really relating to her because she, the way she spoke about where, where her life was, you know, I was waiting for her when she came home from school and, and um, we walked a mile together to this well and, and, you know, listening to her talk about what her life, she was gonna move to, to Lusaka, she was gonna become a nurse, she had these dreams and mm -hmm. it reminded me of, of Ben Affleck uh, and, and, you know, and me when we were kids going, we're going to move to New York, we're going to move to the big city, we're going to be actors. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what kids should be doing at that age. They should have this kind of, this, this hope and, and possibility kind of arrayed out in front of them. And um, it wasn't until I was leaving that I realized, wow, had someone not had the foresight to sink a bore well near this kid's home, she, she would not be in school. She would be spending her entire her entire life, really, uh, looking for wa for water, you know, um, and what does that do to the outcomes, and what does that do to, you know, rather than contributing to the economic engine of her country and living out her dream of being a nurse, she's she's just stuck in this in this in this cycle, yeah. and um, and so and so that so th there there were a number of issues. There was the the absolutely senseless death, um, you know, this year four hundred thousand. Uh, kids will die of something completely preventable. You know, things that might keep our kids out of school for a couple of days. Waterborne diseases. Waterborne yeah. diseases, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For which the, uh, you know, you know if, if your kid has diarrhea, the best thing is, a, you know, water, <laughs> you know, it's a, a, yeah, de yeah, is, is uh, to rehydrate them. So, um, so this, this goes on and on year after year. And um, um, so, there's, so there's that issue, which is this just injustice and this unnecessary uh, suffering, um, and then there's just the the opportunity cost of like what somebody's potential in life mm. is, um, and all of this unrealized potential um, that's so tragic, and and uh, and and this is an issue that's solvable. We solved it here for ourselves a hundred years ago. Yeah. I wonder if you could tell us a story and explain through the experience, maybe of one of the women that we've seen in the slideshow that we've been watching. Um, of how your model works, because it's not, as, as Lynn talked about, it's not a matter of going and we're going to gift you a well. Um, why don't you tell us the story of maybe just one person whom your organization has... has Can I brag about Gary first, <laughs> really quickly? So Gary, um, when we partnered together 15 years ago, Gary had had this incredible uh, insight and, um, and had come up with this innovation, which was basically to, as you heard about in the video a little bit and Lynn talked about, it was to kind of repurpose the, um, the ideas of uh, uh, microfinance that Muhammad Yunus pioneered, um, but apply them to water. And that was a big thought leap for the microfinance institutions at the time because it wasn't seen as an income generating loan. Normally the way that worked at the Grameen Bank was they'd give you, you know, uh, money, you'd, you'd say buy a sewing machine with the money, then you could use the sewing machine to work as a tailor and then you could make the money back and pay off the loan and that made sense to the bankers. Well, Gary, from spending his adult life in these communities, realized that people were paying for water 
already. In the poorest communities, they pay more than the middle class and the, and, and the upper class because they're not connected to the infrastructure. And so they're spending a lot of time or, you know, uh, uh, going foraging for water or buying it from water vendors. The water is unreliable. It's dirty. Uh, it, can, it can make them sick. And it's more expensive. And so realizing that, Gary said, well, what if we could front the money for a loan and connect people to existing infrastructure? Um, you know, they, they should be able to pay the loan back because you're buying all of this time back and it will give them more time to work at a job and pay off the loan. And this was a major thought leap for the microfinance institutions at the time. And in retrospect, it was a brilliant, very simple, but very brilliant idea. And our loans, you know, the, the, what we call water credit, they pay off at above 98%. And 90% of our uh, borrowers are women, and they're among the most vulnerable women in the world. And, um, and, and that's, what's, that's the real success story for us, is it's these women. You know, we've done over 14 million loans and reached 66 million people at this point. Again and again, these women are paying off these loans. It's basically, we just needed to nudge the market towards them and get out of the way and let them solve their own problem. And people do not take out loans for things that they don't want. And so the solutions, you know, what we run into a lot is after five years, half the water projects around the world tend to fail. Uh, it's because they're, they're kind of gifted to communities with a kind of paternalistic, charitable kind of bent where it's, you know, here's your solution, you're welcome, goodbye. And versus organically growing out of the needs of the community. And so, it was, a, it was an ingenious idea, um, so sorry to sidetrack everybody. I just needed to brag about Gary because it's worked it's out. It's never as, happened as, before. <laughs> as, but it's worked out as well as we could have hoped. What Gary saw, you know, the, all those years ago, almost two decades ago, has really come to pass. And, and the real story there is the, these women who, one after another, are repaying these loans. And what that means is it drives the philanthropic cost of capital per person reach down. So. A well system would be $25 to give somebody uh, clean water for life, whereas these, these were down below $5 per person reached because the money keeps getting recycled and, and going This out. is really but interesting. I never thought you were going to be the wonk, <laughs> and now I'm going to tell a story. I was just, <laughs> yeah, I was asking for a story, Matt. <laughs> This is a re nice role reversal. As they say in the South, I was just trying to brag on you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, going to get to Gary's story in one second. But Matt, you were skeptical at first, right, that this model would work. In your well, book, you talk about that you, you well, doubted well, that this well, model was, was I viable. I recoiled at first at the idea that we were going to have the poorest people in the world paying. Yeah. Because mm. it's counterintuitive. Because it's, right? it's counterintuitive. And, 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 it, and, and so I pushed back. And, that was when Gary just, just you know, we, we went. We went to some of these places. He said, they're already paying. They're all, and here's what, you know, what you're really going to do is unleash their potential by getting them out of this death loop of poverty where they have no savings, so they're paying everything they have in their pocket every day. Um, and if you break that cycle, and that's what, once the loan gets paid off, they not only have their time back, but they're relieved of that need to pay um, and maybe you can talk about, you know, some of the, some of the, um, you know, like the, 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 the person we met who, um, you know, when, when you look at actually the, the percentage of their income they were paying. Right. Yeah, talk, yeah. talk about know, that, Gary. It, it, and maybe, I mean, if there is a woman who comes to mind whose story rings, yeah. still sort of resonates in your brain. Well, it, it, for sure. But I think, you know, the other realization at the same time that we're discovering how women cope, and these are coping costs that they pay. Uh, in terms of their health, in terms of lack of education for their girls, uh, in terms of their lost time, their cash. These are all these amazing coping costs that are astronomical. If they don't so, have access to water. If they don't have they access have to, to water, right. So they're, they're trying to, to, to figure this out, and they're paying huge amounts, sometimes 25% of their income. Uh, but we also realized that there was never going to be enough charity in the world to solve this problem. It just the, the math didn't even come close to working. It's orders of magnitude less than what's needed, the trillions that's needed. So it's like, how do we do this in a new way that we can tap into the potential of capital from the bottom up and top down? And so just, uh, I'll do two quick stories because they illustrate this in different ways. Okay. One was with uh, Lena Riza was her name. She was in the Philippines and living in a slum. She was paying about $2 a day to one of these water vendors because she's in the middle of the slum. There are no streams uh, that you could even think about drinking from. Uh, so $60 a month. She took out a loan from one of our local financial partners. Uh, it was less than $400. 
she was paying back about $5 a month for that loan for two years, and her water bill was now $5 a month. Mm. So she was putting $50 back into her pocket every month, and that's like this whole concept of getting financial institutions to suspend disbelief that the, these people will pay back these loans. It's like right there is the, the, the math, right? And so this was after we were many years into it, but that's why it can work, and that's why it's not, you know, uh, Usurous. It's not like trying to, to squeeze money out of people to pay for water because they're already paying for water. The other one was in Uganda, and this woman, she was a grandmother. Uh, her name was Mama Florence. That was the only name that she would give us, Mama mm -hmm. Florence. And she would get on her bike and pedal around to find water every day and bring it back, spending hours doing this. She took out a loan from one of our local financial partners, and we have about 140 of these financial partners around the world now that do this uh, in partnership with us. Uh, again, a few hundred dollars, she put in uh, a very simple pump in a well, and now she had water for her children and her grandchildren, but she didn't stop there, right? She then used the water to grow some vegetables, mm. and then kind of the waste from the vegetables she was then feeding to some pigs she started to raise and was, you know, selling those. Then uh, she recognized that she had this clay soil where she could make bricks, with the water, mm -hmm. so she started making bricks and selling those. Then she recognized that if I build some rooms on my property, I could probably rent those out and make some more income. And now she's making enough to send her kids to school. This, this yeah, yeah, Mama Florence. <laughs> that just, you know, nothing, nothing ever starts without water being the foundation, and Thales was right, you know? Mm -hmm. This woman, it was water that set all this entrepreneurial potential into motion that would have lied dormant. You know, she would have been on her bicycle today still just trying to cope with this. Mm -hmm. And that's why the model can work because people value water so much. They have a, you know, they're spending hours one day and the next day they have a, a tap in their house. And, you know, the women I remember we met in, in India on our trips there, we were there the first day that she had this tap mm. to open. She had put flowers around this tap. Wow. She was burning incense. Mm. She had on her best sari. And it was almost like a deity to her mm. that she now had water that she could turn on the faucet. Mm. That's overnight value creation. That's why these loans can get repaid. If you're spending $60 one day and the next day 10, it's, it's, it's not that genius at the end. It's just math, right? So. You know, we're talking a lot about women and all the images that we've been seeing in the slideshow are, are of women. Um, and there's a line in your book, you're quoting uh, a UN official uh, saying that a woman's body becomes part of the water delivery infrastructure doing the work of pipes, yeah. which is such a vivid image that this woman's whole existence yeah. is basically a, a part of part of a network, part of doing the job that pipes should be doing. Um, and you must see that over and over again. Yeah, yeah. it's, I, I, you know, the, the physical labor of that, you know, moving, you know, 40, 50 pounds of water, sometimes multiple times a day, it really is, it's literally backbreaking. And it, it uh, again, it's just one more factor that makes it so important and so valuable when people can get access in a much more reasonable way. But uh, there's no reason humanity and women should be the water infrastructure when we know how to do it. And part more of the reason. idea there is that this is also a path toward some sort of gender equity, at least mm -hmm. getting part way there. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it disproportionately affects women and girls. Those are, they're usually um, the ones who do, um, you know, the, are, are, the, are the, the human infrastructure. Um, and, and it, you know, it, 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 it means girls aren't in school, um, you know, because they're tasked with um, helping the family survive to the next day, yeah. which means getting the water. Um, and so, obviously, that just perpetuates this terrible yeah. cycle. Gary, you said early on, I think, in this joint project of yours that you, your goal was to solve the water crisis mm. in our lifetime. Um, that's a really lofty goal. <laughs> the first time we ever said that was in front of Lynn Caliento. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and then I think maybe all of our revenue to date was $7 million. Maybe not our annual revenue. Uh. <laughs> well. Maybe I spun that differently. <laughs> but, but when you think of that goal and you think of the numbers of people who still have no access to safe water, no access to sanitation, um, what keeps you optimistic that that is mm. doable, that that is actually a realistic goal for a mm. lifetime? Mm. 
Well, I mean, we're accelerating, for one. Um, you, you know, we reached our first million people in 2012. And, um, and you know, now we're, we're reaching a few million every quarter. Um, you know, there, you know, we know that this solution can can reach about a half a billion people, um, and there are other innova in innovations coming. And we feel like there's going to be a tipping point where it's really about. I mean, we know how to do this. It's really about. I mean, getting out. It's things like this. It's 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 forums like this where we can spread the word, and um, it's 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 having the success that we've had. That that tends to really get people engaged, um, and and we feel that we'll hit a tipping point. Um, you know, and 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 keep accelerating. It's it's our, it's our it's 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 our crazy mission statement. But you know, we we are we are here to put ourselves out of business. Yeah, Gary. Well, I th I think you know what gives me hope is that we have this incredible organization and or organizations now with people thinking about this. Our team, our board, all the time about what is the next uh, entrepreneurial innovation, uh, and that's huge and. I think for me, it was, you know, being true to that mission, that vision. Uh, you know, it, it, maybe it's engineering me, but like when you look at the trajectory you're on relative to the problem that you're trying to solve, and it's clear you're not going to solve it. You can either stick your head in the sand and keep drilling wells, or you can like, you know, engineer your way out of it. Uh, and so to me, that's what we did. And you know, if we had kept doing things the way we were doing, it would have taken us over 500 years to reach the same number of people that we've reached now. And what's important, and you know, for me, why I have the greatest hopes is because we have now been able to create you know what I call the financial plumbing that can move capital from investors in the U.S. and Europe who can invest in the water equity funds. We target competitive financial returns. So this is people who invest, like the Development Finance Corporation and many others, to seek a, a return, a financial return. And then we use that capital to deliver it to those financial partners around the world who break it into millions of microloans. And that reaches the women like Lena Riza and Mama Florence. So we have created the financial plumbing that can connect the global capital markets to women making a few dollars a day. The capital markets, once we get them to suspend their disbelief that this can really work, which we're, we're gaining on that, uh, then the capital pool is theoretically more than enough to be able to reach everybody that this solution will work for. As Matt said, it's a lot of people. But we also know there's some people who are so poor it's not going to work. But what if, you know, right now we're treating everybody in the world who doesn't have water equally in terms of their level of poverty. That just doesn't make any sense. Right. Everybody, there's gradations of poverty. If this, if this solution can work for the, you know, the lion's share of people who lack this, and then that frees up government subsidies, government capital to come in for some of the poorest in the world, then I think we can get line of sight on living that vision. That was my question is, are there places that are just too remote, too poor for the models that you have to work? Yeah, yeah for sure. There's never one size fits all with, with any, anything, and we recognize that, and that's why it isn't all hands on deck. There needs to be the type of work that governments are doing. There needs to be cross subsidies and water tariffs so people in extreme poverty get the, the first few cubic meters of water for free or low cost so that others who are using more water uh, pay more per unit. And that's that's it's it's you know it's just trying to read that there's so much capital we did this uh, this initiative with the world economic forum to look at these coping costs that i was talking about the coping cost for people because they don't have access to water because of the health issues because of the time because of the money it's about 300 billion dollars a year globally globally and if over 10 years <laughs> you know that's more than enough to, if you can just move the capital through the pipelines in a different way and alleviate those capital, those coping costs and move it to more efficient solutions, then these are the things that, that, that give us hope. Yeah. Are there, are there um, as you've gotten more successful and as the word has spread, are you still finding skeptics? Are you still having to do a hard sell? Are you still yes. having to turn to <laughs> Matt Damon for the... <laughs> no, it's interesting, you know, um, uh, President Clinton, who's a former recipient of this uh, and has been a real cheerleader of ours for a long time now, 
Um, he came to our event in 2012 um, when we reached our first million people. And he looked at what we were doing, he looked at the model, and he immediately recognized it was gonna work. And he pulled us aside and he said, you just run those numbers up, you run them up. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, so we thought, you know, well, when we hit five million, that's gonna be a, a tipping point. When we, when we hit 10 million, you know, and so we've, we've hit these benchmarks, and we're 50 million, that's for sure gonna be it. <laughs> Um, and now we're at 66 million, um, and it'll be 70 million by the end of the year. Yeah, thanks. Um, and um, we definitely feel like we're gaining momentum. And I think we were just talking earlier today about maybe it's something that we'll look back on and we'll, and we'll be able to see in more clearly when the inflection point was, like when it, but, but right now it just feels like the same, you know, we're, we're on the merry-go-round and we're at, we're at Davos and we're at, you know, and we're walking into every meeting with our hat in our hands and trying to explain what we do and sometimes meeting incredible partners, some whom, of whom are here tonight, and sometimes, you know, watching, you know, just timing, you know, at what point during the meeting did the eyes glaze over? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, then you just pull out your Bill Clinton imitation and right, you get them right back on track. Bring them back. Are you listening to me at all? <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so, so there are those frustrations. But what it really feels like is a very big mountain. And, and every day is another step. And today is a huge step. This is a really huge and prestigious honor that is going to you know, hopefully be that signal effect, another, yet another signal effect that we, that we need that will help us um, you know, expand the work. I want to end by uh, asking you, Gary, to relate a story that you tell in your book about uh, a drive you took with your dad toward the end of his life um, and something that you didn't know about him and how he grew up. Could, yeah. you, could you tell us about that? Yeah, I forgot about that story being in there. Uh, yeah, this was over 10 years ago. My dad you know, was, was in the final stages of cancer and, uh, in Kansas City where I grew up and where he grew up. And, uh, we rented a van, you know, we had, there's five of us kids and, you know, our families and things, big van and just drove around Kansas City and had him kind of narrate his life in different places where he lived when he was growing up. And we, we got to one point and the house, the houses in this area weren't there anymore, but he's like, yeah, that's where there was a house that we rented. And, uh, and I said, I didn't know that, you know, and he's, he's like, yeah, uh, we uh, had an outhouse in the back of the house where we would, you know, defecate, would use the toilet. And, uh, and he said, and then the city came along and put in plumbing and sanitation. And uh, because of that, they had to raise the rent and they had to move out. They couldn't afford They it. couldn't afford the rent anymore because of that. So it, it just struck me that, you know, only one generation away from, uh, you know, not having access to sanitation uh, for my father and me, you know, taking on this work, and it really, it really struck me. Obviously, it must have struck you yeah, too. Yeah, it did. It was and I'm sure he would be really yeah. proud to know yeah. how Thanks. far Thanks. your life has taken you mm. as well. Sure. I think we should all raise a glass of good DC water <laughs> to toast our honorees, Matt Damon, and Gary White, Water.org. Thank you both so much. <laughs> Congratulations to Fulbright Prize winners Gary White and Matt. Thank you for attending in Washington and online, and to Fulbright Association sponsors, donors, and members for their support. We are grateful to the Marriott Marquis, Washington, D.C., for hosting this event, and to all their wonderful staff. For more on the Fulbright Association and the Fulbright Prize, please visit Fulbright.org. When you have your next drink of clean water, be grateful to everyone who made that possible. Good night, stay healthy, and take care.